what I'm going to do is show you a direction. I'm going to show you something you probably haven't seen before, although it is very basic. It doesn't mean it's basic to follow. This is a life change. When you come in here now, you are making a decision to change the way you live your life. And this model does exactly that thing. So, let's have a look. The cycle of performance. So all results that you've ever had and you ever will have comes from this model, everything. So you being in this room today, the clothes that you've got on or haven't got on, uh, the partner that you are with, the home you live in, the car that you drive, the amount of money in your bank account, where you are within your, uh, within your mindset, Everything comes from the back of this model. This is my own model, it's my own unique model, and this is the cycle of performance. This is a model that you are following at all times, and you'll see. So let's have a look at it, and I'm gonna be asking you some questions. R is results. You can take notes if you want. So what do I mean by results? What do you think I mean by results? Output, how you live, yeah. So output's a good word, the output that we get. So what action we take, we get a particular output. So this is something that isn't taught to any of us in schools. We are taught what to think, not how to think. And there's a big difference. So at school, we're just given loads of information hoping that at some point we can regurgitate that information and use it. But that doesn't help us. So, what controls our results? What do you think it might be? And it begins with an A. Attitude or action? It's actually both, because um, the, the, the answer I'm looking for is, is action, but Action is part of an attitude. So attitude is a more chunked up level. The way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act is an attitude. So, uh, attitude. So you write that down if you, uh, action, sorry. So it's our actions that control our results. Pretty basic, yeah? Everyone agree with that, that we take a certain action, it's gonna give us a certain result. Pretty straightforward. So what is it then that controls our actions? And it begins with a D. Decision. Decisions? Desire? Decisions. The decision that you make is directly before an action. So you make a decision and then you follow with it with an action. Regardless if you're aware of that or not, and you probably aren't aware of it, There's something, though, that controls our decisions. What do you think that might be? And it begins with an E. Emotions, Emotions good. <coughs> now, who's made a decision when you've been a little bit uh, irate and you've regretted that decision afterwards? Raise your hand if that's been you at some point. Those who didn't put your hands up are fucking liars. Our emotions, they affect the decisions that, they make, that we make, don't they? So depending on what state we're in, what emotional state we're in, it's going to have a direct impact on our, uh, our decisions that we make. But there's something that controls our emotions. It begins with a T, what do you think it is? Anything else? We're pretty much on thoughts. Thoughts it is. Thoughts. So the thoughts that we have control our emotions. It's a direct, uh, direct link to it. But there's something that controls our thoughts and it begins with a B. What is it? Good. Beliefs. We've done this before. People have been uh, revising, I think. So it's our beliefs. 
But there's something that impacts our beliefs as well. And it's at the top, it's an SI. What is it? Self-image, good. Now this cycle has impacted your life all the way up to getting to this, this event. That full cycle. And we're going to break, we're going to go into it in a little bit more depth. So everything within there is impacting on your results. And it does a full circle. So the results go back to the self-image, for example. And it just goes round and round and round. Now this is the reason why this model, this is the, the reason for all results. But if you want to know why you feel the way you do, and if you're in a state of uh, anxiety or depression or anything like that, it's because of what's going on in this model. If you want to understand how to get more finance, you want a better car, better house, better relationship, maybe you want to be a better person. You understand this model and you can, you can, you can improve every result in any area of your life. This is the model that I use for everything, every result that I get. It's the reason why, after not even 30 days, I'm able to put this together. When people said it was impossible, you can't do that. You're not gonna be able to put that many people together. We haven't got any of the material. That's why you're signing forms on the Property Investment Academy. We couldn't physically do it. All these people at the front row Paid, paid a higher price tag because they wanted a platinum ticket. We, could, we didn't even have the time to invoice them for it. So we had to tell them to bring money to the, to the event. That's how short for time we were. But it's down to this. It's because of this model that I can produce this very thing. So let's have a little look at it in a, in a little bit more detail. So the results that we get or you get come from our actions. Now there's four things that make up an action. Does anybody think they know what any of those are? This is part of, um, this is part of the actual action itself. We're going into more depth. Two accused. No, not questions. Quality and quantity, good. So the quality of the action we take and also the quantity of the action. The third one is order of sequence. And the last one is consistency. And they need to be present. So I want you to think on, because this is, this is um, you will have heard me say, those who've seen this model before, I'll, I'll have heard this because uh, I like to use this analogy because it, uh, it fits well. So I want you to think of Bic pens and Parker pens. Which one are the following? What's the difference in them cues? Quality and quantity. Are they both successful businesses? Have they both been around for a long time? probably be around long after we're, we've all gone. But two very different models, aren't there? One sacrifices quality for a massing quantity, and one goes purely for quality, don't they? And cut down on the quantity. Both are successful. So when you're making an action, you just need to look at it. Because sometimes, do you think it's better to have quantity over quality? A lot of puzzle faces with that one. Can you think of an example when quantity might be better than... Uh, Chopping up firewood. Adam? Chopping up, chopping up firewood. Perfect example. Do we need quality for chopping up firewood? No. Would quantity be better in that situation? Great example. Um, where would quality be better? Adam? Your wife. Your wife. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> what, the way you uh, treat her or how many you have? <laughs> so they're the four things that make up an action. 
Moving on from that, we have the decisions. <clears throat> now, what is decisions? The Latin, the, the, if you go back, the Latin word for decision is decada. It means to cut off from. Now, this is something that I'm very good at. When I make a decision, there is no plan Bs. There is no plan Cs. Plan Bs and plan Cs are for fucking losers. Write that down, it's an important. <laughs> know what you want, make a decision, and you don't stop till you get there. So the decisions that we make have that direct impact on the actions. Now let's have a little look at the emotions. Because this is something that's changing all the time. Your emotions, how many, emotion, how many times are your emotions changing a day alone? Yeah? Now, here's an example of that, because if you look at things like uh, some of the labels, which we're going to come on to later this afternoon when I'm back on again, is with emotions, there's a lot around things like bipolar, for example, um, and uh, other medical things like that, where they say that they have two extremes. Now, I'll almost guarantee that most of you in this room have extremes throughout the day. Do you not? I leave the bathroom floor wet and Gemma's fucking bipolar kicks in. <laughs> Especially when she slipped on her ass a few months ago. So, do we all have those trigger things? Who, raise your hand if you're one of those that fucking hates it when someone's chomping in your ear. Someone's eating next to you. And it kicks in your bipolar, doesn't it? That instant... What else is there? Snoring. Snoring. Raise your hands if that's one of your things. And it can trigger us like that, can't it? It can be rapid. It's the meaning that we've put to the thing. So when people say, oh, I've got bipolar, I have extremes of, of emotions to high and low, we fucking all have. We all have bipolar. Every single one of us have multiple personalities throughout the day. Every single one of us. So you aren't special anymore if you've got bipolar. We've all fucking got it. And I'm going to show you that throughout the, 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 the couple of days that you're here. That we all show these same traits. We all have certain things we do throughout the day. Certain behaviours. So they're moving around to thoughts. Who is it who con what is it and who is it that controls our thoughts? Who controls your thoughts? Yourselves. So if you control your thoughts, who controls your emotions? You do. Raise your hands if you're in agreement with that. Raise your hands if you don't agree with that. Challenge me. So the meaning you put to something, yeah. is that not a thought? <coughs> if we have a meaning to a certain thing, is that not a thought? An attachment to emotion. Yeah. Any meaning that you put to something is a thought. Who gets road rage? Put your hand up if you get road rage. Raise your hand if you're completely calm in a car and it doesn't bother you and you don't let it phase you. Now look at the room. There was half and half there. It's exactly the same thing, isn't it? Nothing changes. It's the meaning that we put to the event. The response to any event is far more important than the event itself. But what we are very good at doing as humans is getting fixated on the actual event, on the result. But it's the response to the event that is way, way, way more important. Now, there's an example of that that I seen uh, last year with a guy who, um, I forget the full story now, but the general gist of it was... Um, he was, uh, he was going around prisons to speak to people who were on death row. Did people see that or not? And he asked a guy, 
Um, th this, this guy who was doing this interview and who went around the prisons, uh, he was beaten by his parents. He was neglected. Uh, parents were alcoholics. And he turned out to be a very successful guy. Very successful. And he went interviewing people on death row to see what it was. Why were they in that situation? What was it that triggered it? And when speaking to one guy, the guy, he asked him, why are you here? Why are you in death row? Why did you kill all the people? And the guy said, because my parents beat me as a child, because I was neglected. So there's two people with exactly the same experience, not exactly the same, but nigh on. And one's used that to, um, to influence him in a better way. And the other person has, uh, well, it's happened to me, so... Um, that's why I am like I am. And that's a victim mentality. And we're going to be going on to that a lot more this afternoon. We're going to be going into four, four levels of consciousness and where you are on that chart. So, can you see that it is not the event, it's the response that is way more important than the event? And that's exactly the same with the road rage. The exact same event is happening and two people respond in a completely different way. Now, I used to be the worst person in the world for road rage. Horrendous. I have gotten out of my car and tried to fucking fill people in. That's the level that I used to get road rage. But I don't anymore. Now I just smile because I know I've got control over it. The event hasn't changed. What changed? Yep, yeah, my meaning towards it, the thoughts to it. So here's the thing. Let's go back to that again. Who controls our thoughts? You do. So who's controlling your emotions or at least has the ability to? You do. Nothing else. So I want you to hold that thought. So if you've got any sort of anxiety, you've got any sort of depression or anything like that, now I want you to bear with me here because this might be touching a raw nerve with some people. Until you've fully heard me out, you won't get the proper understanding of this. Because right now you've probably been led to believe that it's that label that you were given that is making you feel that way. It's fucking not. It's the thoughts that you have that are creating the emotion. Our emotions are a reflection of what's going on in our head. So how you feel at all times is a reflection of where you are in your head. And when you change your thoughts, you change your emotions. And I'm gonna demonstrate that in a little bit. We're gonna be doing a couple of exercises and I'm gonna make you feel shit. And then I'm going to take you back to another place and I'm going, to show, I'm going to prove to you how your emotions shift, every single one of you, by what we're thinking and what we're seeing. So, we know that our thoughts control our emotions and there's one thing above that, it's our beliefs, isn't it? So where do our beliefs come from? Where do our beliefs come from? Learned past experience, good. So there can be internal and external. So uh, raise your hand if you believed in Father Christmas. Still do. Still do. <laughs> There's a couple of upset people in the room now. <laughs> that was a belief that was told to us, wasn't it? And we believe that. We thought that was true and what type of emotions. So just look at that, for example, in this situation. Somebody told us, a person of influence, that there was a guy called Father Christmas and he brings you all these presents. Brilliant, we all love presents as a kid. What type of thoughts does that trigger off? Positive ones. What emotions do we get? Excited, don't we? What type of decisions do we make? We start putting carrots out and fucking cookies to feed the guy, <laughs> don't we? That's the actions. So the decision we're going to make is I'm going to make this guy welcome. If he's coming to my house to bring all his stuff for me, then I'm going to at least feed his, uh, his reindeers and give him uh, some mince pies and things like that. And the result is we get the presents, brilliant. 
Now that's that cycle in motion there, that's what's going on. So beliefs come internal and external. They come external from, pe from people around us. And that is why it is so important the people that you put yourself around. The people that you put yourself around are influencing the person that you are. Who's heard the saying that you become an average of the five people you spend most time with? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. That is fucking true. There's a lot of things said in personal development and uh, the so-called fluffy world, what some people call it, but that is true. You will become an average of the people you spend most time with. And it's the reason why I invest in myself at the level that I do. Because you can't get that kind of training. You can't put yourself around those people. They don't exist on the... Not, they don't live next door to us. Or at least not to most of us. So you have to be able to raise your game. It's a be, do, have. There's a misconception that people who have money invest in themselves. The reason they've got money and they've got happiness is because they invested in themselves. And that's the reason why I am where I am now. So beliefs, external and internal. Now, how do you think they might come internal? How do we get an internal belief? What happens? Yeah. Yeah. So you could think about something and accept it's true. Um, and also from things that we do. So raise your hand if you've ever done, you didn't think you could do something and you've done it and you're quite surprised and thought, hey, I didn't think I could do that. Yeah, look around the room. Keep your hands raised, please. And just have a look around the room now. You've all got your hands up. Raise your hands if you've believed you could do something and it didn't turn out that way and you were a bit disappointed. Raise your hands, look around the room. Now that's impacting on the thoughts and emotions that we have. That's what's making up your beliefs. The people that you put yourself around through experience um, of what you've done in the past and, how, and the meaning that you put to that as well. And then at the top we have our self-image. Now, self-image is one of these things where um, people look, can look at it in a negative way. So when I say to people, you need to improve your self-image, we need to do work on your self-image, um, a lot of people can look at that as a, as a negative thing. It's not. Every single one of us can improve our self-image. Every single one of us. And that is impacting the beliefs that you will accept. So here's an example of it. Who believes that they could go out this year and make two million pound? Not many. I do, because I'm doing it this year. Now, if you ask me the question, do I think I can make two billion this year? There's gonna be a limitation there. I'll tell you that now, I'm being honest with you. Even though I have total belief in myself, the first thing I'll start to do is think, well, how would you do that? How is it possible to scale at that kind of level? And when we can't work that out, we own that belief. And you'll be shifting up and down on that scale. And that's to do with our self-image. So somebody like uh, Donald Trump, now he might not like Donald Trump, but he's a pretty successful guy, isn't he? And if I was to say, or you were to say to Donald Trump, do you think you can make two million pound this year? He'd laugh and say, I could make that in a week. Would he not? And that's because his self-image is at a different level within a certain area. Now, our self-image might be really high in one area, but low in another area. And the same with our beliefs. So we might believe we're really good at something, but we're really shit at something else. And that is impacting um, how we accept things and the meaning we put to things. There's something else that's the inner core of us. Now, I've already, um, I already have a good idea. Well, I, I pretty much knew anyway. Uh, the first questions that I asked you were based around what? What did I say? Values. So your values are the inner core of you. 
raise your hand if you know Dickhead. Raise your hand if you know Dickhead. Yeah. <clears throat> what you are basically saying is if you know a Dickhead <clears throat> is that their values are in line with yours. That's all you're saying. That's all it means. They have a different set of values to you. Because I'll guarantee you now, that person you thought about there thinks you're a dickhead as well. <laughs> Just remember that. And that is because you've got a different set of values. Who's right or wrong? Probably neither of you. It's probably sat somewhere in the middle, if you were, if you were to really look at it. But it's our values, and these play a major part in what we do and how we feel. So when we are following our values, we generally feel good. And when you're going against your values, you'll feel shit. They impact how you feel. And if you aren't aware of that, you can't do anything about it. And that is the reason why over the next couple of days, a lot of these things I'm teaching you is to raise your awareness. So we're not aware of what we're not aware of. Does that make sense? We're not aware of what we're not aware of. So it's my role to raise your awareness to uh, the different emotions you have, what's going on. If you feel a certain way, then the thir first thing I would say to you is ask yourself the question, what thought am I having now that's triggering this emotion? That's the first thing you need to do. What thoughts am I having that's triggering this emotion? Because there has to be. It's physically impossible not to have a thought that's linked with that emotion. So we are incapable of having a positive thought and a negative emotion. We can't do it. Just like we can't have a, a positive thought and a negative emotion. We can't do it. The emotion's always in line with the thoughts and the meaning that we've give to those thoughts, always. Now, you might have a different meaning to the same... Two people can have a different uh, meaning to the same thing. So an example of that is the Twin Towers. Did half of the world cry and think that that was devastation? Maybe you were one of those people. Did certain parts of the world celebrate and think that that was one of the best things that's happened? They did, didn't they? And that's just because they are, we have different beliefs, different values, that's all it is. They believe that that's right. And if you were to look at that and why that happened, in their minds, you're in our country and you're attacking us. So there's a little bit of fuck you, we'll come to your country and we'll attack you. Now I have that understanding now, I can empathise with things that I didn't used to be able to, I can put myself in somebody else's shoes and I can at least see where they're coming from. I still might think they're a dickhead, but at least I can see what, where their level of thinking is coming from and that's exactly what's happening to you. And that's the purpose of these models, it's to raise your awareness, to give you skills so you can go away and do practical things with these skills. So it's raising your awareness and then giving you a strategy to move from where you are, regardless where that is, to where you want to be. Because do we all want to improve our results in at least one, two, three areas in our life? Raise your hands if you want to improve. Exactly, look around the room. And that, the reason for that is that's naturally in as one as the human needs, is growth. One of the higher level human needs is growth, and that's to grow and get better results. How are we for time? Okay, having a quick look at that before we move on. I'm gonna cover this a little bit more in depth later, but I just want to introduce you to it now. That when you're having a certain emotion, remember that it's a thought that's in line with that. So there's a certain thought that's created it. Now, if you ever have an inconsistency where you think, you feel, you, you think you're thinking a certain way, but your feelings aren't matched with those thoughts, then it's the emotions that are the ones that are right. It's not the thinking. 
It's not the thinking mind. Because the emotions are just a reflection of what's going on in the mind. So if you think, if, you, if someone says, how do you feel? And you go, yeah, I think I feel good. But you know inside you feel shit. That inconsistency, always listen to the emotion, not the thinking. Always listen to the emotion. Because it's the emotion that's right. Beliefs. Who knows the story about the guy who was trapped in the fridge? Anyone heard that? Sean? So a guy, um, what, what basically happened was this guy was locked in um, a cooler. You know the type of places where you keep the, keep the meat and stuff like that in uh, your Tesco's and things? One of the freezer units? A guy was trapped in one of those units. He got locked in prior to him finishing work. And he could feel himself getting very cold. Obviously, it's a very low temperature in those fridges. And what he started to do was as he started to lose his senses, he actually started to think, I'm going to die. I'm probably going to die here in this fridge. And he started to write a letter and writing how he was feeling at certain points to the point where it was just scribbles on the paper and you couldn't make much sense what he'd wrote. And the next morning, he was found dead. That fridge never once dropped below, below normal room temperature. The fridge wasn't on. He killed himself with his own beliefs. And we have the, the ability to do that with anything. So when you see somebody, and, and I know there's nurses and things in the room here today as well, you see that with patients. They're told they've got six months to live and what happens? They fucking die, don't they, at six months. They die almost around that time. Now, if you look at uh, the other extreme, your Lance Armstrong's in the world. Lance Armstrong had cancer all over his body. He had it in his brain. He had it everywhere. And he was told, how long did he have to live? Does anybody know? Six weeks maximum. Maximum to live. His whole body was, it was all over his whole body, had cancer everywhere. What happened to him? Fully recovered, didn't he? Now, is Lance Armstrong your normal type of guy? He's not, is he? Took steroids, you could say that. There's fucking loads of people that take steroids of cancer and I don't see them recovering at that level and then going on to win 5-2 to France's whatever he won. Lance Armstrong is a great example because his belief in himself and what's possible, would you say it's higher than most of us in this room, if not all of us? Yeah. So is Lance Armstrong the kind of guy who's just going to go down without a fight? He's fucking not, is he? And that's why people like that survive. It's down to the belief. And it's something called the uh, nocebo effect. So raise your hand if you've heard of placebo effect. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Okay, what is that? What is, what is placebo effect? Believing in something that someone tells you. So they, you know, if you're ill and they give you a medicine and tablets, that will make you better. Yep. So you think taking that tablet will make you better. Yep. And you take a tablet that could be a sugar pill, which they generally give you and it makes you better. A third of studies in medication is around placebo. Now, I want you to just think of that. It is not the sugar tablet that made the person better. What is it? It's the belief in the sugar tablet. That's what made them better. Now, there's the opposite of that. Raise your hand if you've heard of the nocebo. It's not really talked about. The nocebo effect is the belief that something can make you ill. The belief that I will die if I'm in this fridge at this temperature. It kills people just like the belief in a sugar pill can make you better, which has been proven. There's got to be polarity that. There's got to be the opposite side. So if you believe a certain thing, it's going to fucking happen. So it's my job to, uh, when I'm doing things like that, is I want to raise your awareness and I want to improve your beliefs. Because if I can improve you at this level, I don't need to worry about your results because they'll take care of themselves. 
So I never ever focus on my results. I look at them, I obviously monitor them, but I aren't ever fixated by them. Because all is I have to do is work on my self-image, work on my beliefs and what's going to happen automatically. The result's just going to happen, isn't it? I don't need to even think about that. The result will be directly in line with the type of beliefs I have and my self-image. And this is the reason why I can create change in people so quickly. So when I've sat down with people who've been suicidal, and I've done this quite a few times now where um, people come out of it and they're, they're completely shell-shocked of, how did I feel that shit and now I feel like that? And what I do is I work at that level because I know if I improve that, everything else will take care of itself. So I want you to look at that model and tell me how many of those things are internal and how many are external. Have a look at that now for the next 30 seconds. So I'm going to go around and you're going to shout them out. Is it internal or external? So look how many of those are internal. All of that, there, they're the only two that are external. All of that has to happen before you get any result. So anything that you look at in physical form, so have a little look around the room now. The items of clothing that you're wearing, the items of clothing that somebody else is wearing next to you, the carpet, the speakers, everything you're looking at was first created in the mind of a man or a woman. It was created in the invisible before it became in its physical form. And that is everything. Everything that you see or experience happened here first. So all is I have to do is show you how to improve these and what's going to automatically to the way that you feel. It's going to change, isn't it? It's not rocket science. Now, those of you who've had labels of certain things off a doctor, I'm going to show you through the two days why that's bollocks. Now, this offends people sometimes, and it's the reason why uh, I can be attacked on my posts. And there's a very valid reason for that, and there's a reason why I don't take it personal. It's because we be what we believe in, we protect. This here is our identity. And you start telling us that we are something that we think, we, if you think that someone tells you something the opposite to what you think you are, our normal, our uh, natural reaction to that is to defend it. The first thing you want to do is defend it. It's the ego within us all. So if you ever argue with somebody that is ego. That is you protecting your identity of I'm right and you're wrong. And it's in every single one of us. We all have ego, every single one of us. And if you have any arguments at all, then that's your ego showing up. It's you defending your identity. So when I tell people that what they've been told by a doctor, and that's become their identity, can you see how it's going to offend people? Yeah? It is, isn't it? It's the reason why I'm not offended when people say some of the things that they do to me. Now, what you might be thinking is, what qualifications have you got over a doctor? Raise your hand if you're thinking that and be brutally honest. 10% of the room? Well, here's a question for you. What profession has the most suicide rates in it? Doctors, physicians. And it is the number one in America as well at the moment. It has always been in the top five. What does that tell us?
that knowing something at an intellectual level does absolutely fucking nothing. Understanding something at an intellectual level does nothing. Because human beings don't behave off intellectual information. Raise your hand if you're a smoker. Be honest, get your hands up. Third of the room, that's dropping, that's surprising. Because if you'd have asked that question probably 20 years ago, there'd probably been 80% of the room. Now, what does it say on a packet of cigarettes? What are the pictures like now on packets of cigarettes? So for those of that you are in the room, do you want to die that are smokers? So why are you smoking? If you know, do you think that the lie, when there's those pictures of people's throats hanging out and shit, saying this is going to kill you, do you think that's a lie? No. It's because at an intellectual level, it doesn't impact us. What impacts us when we own something at an identity level? What creates temporary change is at an emotional level. So, you'll go one or two ways generally with emotion. <coughs> if you are a smoker and you have a heart attack, for example, or your little daughter says, Dad, please don't smoke, you're going to die and I want you to be grow old enough to see me have kids, do you think that that'll have an impact on our emotions? Now, might that stop us at least think, fucking hell, yeah. It's a fair point, I'm going to stop. But here's the problem with emotions, the temporary. It's in line with commitment. So, you could be hanging off the edge of a cliff by your fingers, and it doesn't matter how much will that you have, at some point are you going to drop off? You are, aren't you? Eventually, you're going to drop off no matter how much will you've got. So at an emotional level, it can create temporary change. And you'll go one or two ways. Quite often, um, you'll regress the other way. So raise your hand if you've been out on a night on the piss, and the next day you said, I'm not fucking drinking ever again. <laughs> Look around the room. And who drank the week after? Why is that? Because you forget about it, don't you? The emotion changes. You have different thoughts. So the time when you're feeling shit and hung over, and all you're doing is thinking about surviving, <laughs> the week later, when the sun's out, and your mate's got his shorts on and stuff, and he's telling you about all the birds that are going out tonight, what happens to your emotions? On well, that for females, when your mates come round and go, we're going to do this, whatever you do. <laughs> Should not be that many laughs, females. It changes, doesn't it? Our emotions change. Now, going back to the smoker, at an emotional level, the little girl saying to her dad, dad, please stop smoking that could have an impact and make you stop smoking for a temporary, for a, um, a short period of time. But if you were to ask me if I want a cigarette, what do you think I'd say? Because I don't smoke, by the way. What do you think I'd say? No, I don't smoke, exactly. Because it's part of my identity. I don't need to have a battle of will. I don't need to have a battle of commitment. I own that, that's who I am, I don't smoke. I'm not saying smoking's right or wrong, personally it's not for me, but do I do a lot of things that other people would uh, not agree with, like riding my motorbike 180 mile an hour? So I'm not gonna criticize people, I'm just using it as an example. But the reason why I say no is because I'm not a smoker. And this is the same with doctors. It does not matter one single fucking bit that they've got a qualification. 
because it is at the lowest end of the spectrum. Now, they might have gone into being a doctor because of an emotional level. That might have triggered them in seeing somebody who is ill and thinking, I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. But it's not good enough to have an impact on your behaviour. And it's the reason why doctors commit suicide. And it's the reason why when people say to me, what qualifications have you got to a doctor? It doesn't fucking matter. Because I own this shit. All of these models and everything that I am, I own it at an identity level. That's who I am. Because the amount of people who I know who are far more intelligent than me, even in this industry, as, uh, as speakers or um, professors, in mental health and uh, personal growth. There's, there's people I know with miles more knowledge than me, but they don't live to that knowledge. Does that make sense? What I do, because I aren't the brightest in, uh, compared to some people in certain areas, um, is, and now that's a belief, and could that affect me? Yes, it could, but I don't, um, I don't allow that to, is... I rinse every little bit out of my identity, so out of the knowledge that I have. So I'll ask myself, do I believe it at an identity level and I own it? And doctors study for how long? Seven years? I've been doing this shit for 12 years. And most people who study, fucking hell, I've seen you use at university a lot. You go fucking two days a week and you do about four hours. That's offended a few people. <laughs> but it's true, you do. I do this shit, and you can ask Gemma, I get up on a morning and I pour two to three hours in on a morning. When I go to bed at night, I play things. When I'm in the gym, I am playing personal growth. I'm learning about human behavior. Every single part of my life, this is what turns me on. This is my passion. I watch people, I watch what people do. I study people. I'm a reflector. So I know how to get the best out of every one of you. And that's why it doesn't bother me a bit when people say, you haven't got the qualifications, it doesn't matter. And that's because I own it at an identity level. So we're going to move on. So I want you to just uh, quickly have a look at that model again and just think how that model can help you. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to put the music on for two minutes and I want you to reflect quietly by yourself on that model around your emotions and the way that you feel. What thoughts do you have or what beliefs do you have that are triggering them emotions? And how can you improve that moving forward? So let's do that. I'll give you about two minutes to reflect nice and quietly. Mic's off. That's why everyone's at the back panicking. See how the reaction to that was not to panic. So it wasn't the event. Did I fuck up? Did I fuck up? Yeah. Now, some people, that might have put them in a state of panic. And I've said, I'd said earlier, because I've gone a bit of a tangent here, but it's important. It's the response, not the event, that's the most important thing. So it's not the fact that I didn't turn the mic on and I cocked up a little bit. It's the way that I respond to what happened. Now, last year, because I won't ever make that mistake again, I did it the opposite way. I left the mic on when I went to the toilet. <laughs> that was a major fuck up. <laughs> and when I came back to the room, everyone was meant to be doing a quiet exercise and the whole room was fucking pissing themselves. And I thought, why are they laughing? They're meant to be quiet working. Shit, I know what I've done. And people actually thought it was meant to be relaxing music in the background. <laughs> but it's the response to the event. Now, you're going to have breakthroughs during these two days. A lot of you will have multiple breakthroughs. There'll be a lot of realisation. There'll be a lot of reflecting. You will automatically replay things backwards. Now, the difference between uh, someone who's good on the stage and someone who's not is if you are looking at, there's no windows in here, but if you're drifting and you're not looking at me, 
I know you're in a state of reflection, and that's good, because that's where we learn. You're in a subconscious state. So I allow you to go to that place. And when I want to bring you back, I'll bring your attention because I'll say things like, now this is important, or write this down. And when I say that, I'll bring your attention back to me. So I allow you to go off in a state of reflection because that's where you're taking the learns. So on that exercise we just did there where you had a think into it, is there anybody who'd be willing, who had a breakthrough, quite a big realization, that would be willing to share it with everybody else if we were to give you a microphone? Is there anybody in the room that is willing to share that? Vicky, give her a microphone and give her a round of applause as well. Hello. Hello, I'm just going to turn into a chameleon here and blend in with the chair, go a bit red. Um, talking about beliefs and mental health, um, a few years ago I went to my doctor's. I was feeling tired all the time, run down, not motivated, zero sex drive, you know, as it goes. Um, and my doctor said, it's classic symptoms of depression, you're depressed. And I'm like, well, I don't feel depressed. He said, no, it's classic symptoms of depression. I'm like, okay, well, I don't go home and cry. I'm not sad, I'm a happy person, no. And I spent nearly, nearly two, three years on antidepressants. My husband turned around, he said, you're not depressed. I'm like, I know, yeah. <laughs> so, so like for years, this doctor had told me that I'm depressed. So I'm like, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. I'm depressed, you know, this is why this is happening. I wasn't depressed. I was just maybe not in a place where I was sure what I wanted to do, but that, that was the belief that I had in my mind that the doctor had said to me, you're depressed. I thought, okay, and went with it for about two or three years on these tablets, which I didn't need because I wasn't depressed, <laughs> but I believed it. So you believed it and it became the reality. Yeah. Can you see that? There's somebody who's just shared an experience with you who's been put on medication because of somebody else's belief. If anyone tells me a belief, I always validate it first. I aren't owning some shit that you want to put in my mind. I want to know where you've got that from first if I want to accept it. So even if I'm at a level of uh, education, I want to know the source of who's giving me that belief because as soon as I own it, it's going to be become part of my reality, isn't it? And my life is going to change from it and I'm going to get a different result from that. So if somebody tells you something that's negative about you, like that, then you need to validate where has that come from and what proof have they got to, to, to state that. Because in most cases, it's just the negative people we're around um, or someone else's perception. And, and a, an example of that is if you think of sports like gymnastics, how can one person vote a 10 out of 10 and another person vote a 7 out of 10? What is the reason for that? Anyone? Beliefs. It's beliefs, it's your perception, isn't it? It's how you sing, so you're homing in on something different. Does anybody know how much information we take in per second? Our subconscious mind is taking in two million bits of information per second. Our conscious mind is only capable of taking in 134 bits of information per second. Meaning that you are deleting 1,999,000 parts of it. It's a very, very small amount that we're actually conscious of. And that's the reason why we have different perception. That was a great example, so thank you for that. So if there's anybody else who's been told that in the room, is there a chance that that wasn't right for you as well? I would just ask you to think on, on, on that very thing. Um, okay, moving on. Thank you for that, Vicky. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play with your emotions. So I'm going to change the way that you feel. And I can do that at any point, to be honest. Because looking at that model now, what do I need to do to change your emotions? It's dead easy. I can change someone's emotions like that, that rapid. What do you think I do? Beliefs? There's a, there's a miles easier way. A thought. So if I get you to shift your focus 
You will, your thoughts will be in line with that focus, will they not? I, if I say to you, think of the dickhead, all go there now, go to that dickhead. What does that do to your emotions? Makes you want to smack someone, whack them around the head, yeah? There's a lot of people laughing because that's because you know that, it triggers that. So I can, t I can play with emotions dead easy. And that's what's happening to you multiple times a day. So I'm going to do something now. Um, first of all, who relaxes and watches things like... Uh, so if you're an EastEnders fan, raise your hands. EastEnders? Coronation Street? More of a Coronation Street? National News? All of that shit is having a massive impact on what happens to you at all times of the day. Not just why you're watching it, because you start to believe those things. Because our mind doesn't know the difference of something we vision and something that's real. It doesn't understand the difference. We automatically feel those emotions. So raise your hand if you've uh, had the dream that your partner's cheated on you and you woke up pissed off. Yeah. Now, some people, I was speaking to a guy a few months ago and he said his, his, his partner had this dream and didn't speak to him for two days. It's fucking Peter laughing, that means you do it, don't you? Raise your hand if you do that to your partner. Good, thank you for being honest. It doesn't mean fucking anything, it's not a sign, it's nothing, it's just some bullshit thing that you dreamt about. It's the mind overworking. But when you are absorbing that stuff, it has an impact on, on, on who you are. So I want you to watch this clip now. Mum's got cancer. I am one that you're not gonna die. I promise you. It's impossible to say what would be the tipping point. It could be ten drinks, or it could be one. There is no longer a safe amount for you to drink. Because you were the only daughter. <laughs> the only little girl I ever really had.
How does that make you feel? <laughs> Is there anybody who watches that and it doesn't have any impact on them? Yeah. Why? Okay, so you've got a different meaning to it. And that's the reason why you aren't being involved in it. I know that that's not real, but it still impacts my emotions. It does. Watching that, I felt a shift in my breathing. I felt a shift in, what, in watching that. Um, and that's the reason why it, it chokes me up a bit, watching shit like that. And the reason for that, I was having a conversation with somebody this morning who uh, also suffered from PTSD, who was uh, told that he, he couldn't be cured from it, um, told that he wouldn't get rid of it. And uh, he's not suffering from any of those things anymore. That impacts how we, how we feel. Now, a question for you is, if you're watching this kind of stuff, if you're watching national news about rapings, murders, muggings, and all of those things and programs like this, what do you think you are fucking doing to your mind? You are training it to be depressed. Your mind is a garden. Whatever you plant in your mind is going to grow. Would you plant weeds and expect beautiful flowers? You wouldn't, would you? So why would you pour in loads of shit and get a double dose of reading the morning paper and the news and then expect to go out and feel good? That's not normal behaviour, is it? What you put in is going to come out. That's a fact. Now I want you to watch this one. Does identified as mentally retarded put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And as he talked, my heart began to beat fast. Tears began to run by my eyes and, and I was in the back just listening to him because the speech he was giving that speech was for me. And he said, Les Brown, he said, if you want to do anything worthwhile in life, you've got to be hungry. I told Mr. Washington I wanted to become a disc jockey. And so I started working to develop myself. He said, I want you to practice every day being a disc jockey. I said, but I don't have any job now. He said, it doesn't matter. He said that it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And as I was working to develop myself, I applied for a job as a disc jockey, WMB on Miami Beach. I went to a guy named Milton Butterball. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? I'd like to get a job as a disc jockey. He looked at me, he said, do you have any broadcast background? I said, no, sir, I don't. Do you have any journalism background? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, we don't have any jobs available. I said, yes, sir. I went back to Mr. Washington and I told him, he said, don't take it personally. He said, most people are so negative they will have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, go back again. So I went back again. I said, how you doing, Mr. Butterball? My name is Les Brown. He said, I know what your name is. What do you want? I said, I'd like to know whether or not you have any jobs at this jockey, sir. He said, didn't I just tell you yesterday we didn't have any jobs? I said, yes, sir, but I know whether or not somebody got laid off or somebody was fired, sir. He said, no one was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day like I was seeing you for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. And I went to get him some coffee. After a while, I would get their lunch and dinner, and I would go in the control rooms and take the disc jockeys their food, and I would not leave until they would ask me to leave. One Saturday afternoon, while I was at the radio station, a guy named Rock was drinking while he was on the air. 
I was the only one there looking at him through the control room windows, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. Pretty soon the phone rang and it was the general manager. And I answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, Les, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all turn up the radio and come out on the front porch. I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes. And I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, do you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. I couldn't wait to get behind those controls. I put on an old Stevie Wonder record called Fingertips. I sat down behind that turntable. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter, playing Papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, and dubbly qualified to bring you satisfaction, a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. I was hungry. You got to be hungry. Begin to know that you have greatness within you. And if just one of you here begin to envision yourselves as being blessed and highly favored to reach your goals, if just one of you capture the essence of what that means, that you have greatness within you and a responsibility to manifest that greatness, that you can make your parents proud, you can make your school proud, you can touch millions of people's lives and the world will never be the same again because you came this way. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen, coming to speak to people. And I was facing financial difficulties in my own life. I was behind on my bills and my dreams and I'm saying to them, you can live your dream. It was hard, ladies and gentlemen. It was very difficult to pick myself up each day believing that I could do it. There were times that I doubted myself. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. Don't give up on your dream. By continuing to push forward, by continuing to run toward my dream, that one day I would have my own talk show. It's a long shot, ladies and gentlemen, from Liberty City, an abandoned building on a floor never knowing my mother or father. It's a long shot being here with you today in this dome in Atlanta. It's a long shot. No college training, labeled, educable, mentally retarded. But I kept running toward my dream. Don't stop. Don't stop running toward your dream. How does it make you feel? Inspired. Inspired? Empowering? Motivated? Grateful? Emotional. Emotional? Better than the last one? Now this is all that I do. When people ask me, how are you in that state? It's because I pour in all the time. I look after my garden. I remove all the shite whether that's people, uh, environments, the news. I won't watch anything at all that's negative. Why would I want to plant weeds in my garden? Why would you want to put weeds in your garden? And the more weeds that you start to remove, it does one thing. It creates space. And with that space, if you move forward and take action and you start putting flowers and planting good things in your mind, then what do you think is going to start happening? You're going to have a change of how you feel, aren't you? You're going to have a change on focus. You're going to feel better within yourselves. You are being impacted all the time by things like that. And most things you don't even realise. So I would like you to just think into that. Um, that is me done for, for this session. So I would like you to think into um, the
the things that we've gone over, because I am going to be building on those over the next two days, it's going to become a lot more apparent.